when a 51-year-old Michigan housewife disappears. Where is she? How come nobody's heard anything? The desperate search for truth. The dog immediately went to the mound of dirt and started digging. Exposes a web of betrayal and deceit. She had caught him quite a few times. And I thought, in my entity. How does one man's morbid obsession... Oh, wow. ...and a taboo affair... He was in there with somebody else, having sex. And there's... How twisted is this? ...lead to a horrendous crime. I started thinking, this is it. That's my mom. I'm Tony Harris. In my 30 years as an investigative reporter, I've learned that every crime reveals a world of trouble. A family, a neighborhood, an entire town, changed forever. Come with me to the scene of the crime. Michigan is a blue-collar town where everyone works hard for what they have. Nothing here is given. A suburb of Detroit, Warren feeds the region's famous auto industry, and a love for cars runs deep here. In 2014, when 51-year-old Kim DeJohn goes missing, her sudden disappearance rattles her family and social circles and the investigation into her whereabouts brings to light a dark and sordid tale. I'm here to find out how a fascination with the macabre escalated from hobby to homicide. Jennifer Outman is Kim's daughter from her first marriage. What's this one here? Look at this one. That is her wedding day with Lloyd. She looked great in that photo. Yeah, I liked her dress. She, she really looked really nice great in it. Now. She was very caring. She liked taking care of people. Even after she had gotten older and she helped take care of her husband's family. Jennifer is already out of the house and on her own by the time her mom falls for a steel worker named Lloyd DeJohn. What do you recall about your first meeting with Lloyd when you get a, an actual opportunity to get a sense of the man? Different. Different. Um, you know, he was energetic, goofy, weird. But, I mean, I thought he was nice. He treated me fine. He treated my kids good. My mom was really happy. She seemed really happy. After a whirlwind romance, Lloyd and Kim get married in 2003. When's the first time you remember Lloyd telling you about meeting Kim? I don't recall, do you? Uh, they were already married. Lloyd didn't discuss this idea of, look, I'm crazy, head over heels in love, and I'm going to marry her. Lloyd's private. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> kind of private. Were you shocked? Were you surprised? You're shaking your head. Or are you shaking Lloyd, your head? Lloyd don't, nothing Lloyd does surprises me too much. I mean, Lloyd just off the spur of the moment does stuff. Amy Beery is Lloyd's daughter from his first marriage. She lived with her dad and stepmom on and off as a teenager. First couple of years were great. They seemed happy? Yeah, loving, playful, always joking around together. Whenever Amy stayed with her dad and Kim, she got a front row seat to their rather unusual hobby, collecting and restoring vintage hearses. You remember your father's first hearse? Yeah. What'd you think of it? I thought it was a bit weird at first. <laughs> they want to drive around in a hearse. <laughs> How did Dad explain it? He explained there's a whole club and they make neat things out of these hearses and it's so much fun. Was Kim into it as much as your father? I she grew into it. Yeah. yeah, she had just much fun decorating. And... Collecting hearses is a family affair for the DeJohns. Lloyd's brother, Stan, shares his passion for the strange. 
Wait a minute. Stay creepy? Will you open it up for me? Yeah. Oh, wow. And that's why we stay creepy. <laughs> oh, my God. You know, we're part of the Hearst Club. Just Hearsting Around. Is that, is that the name of it? Just yep. Hearsting Around? Just Hearsting Around. When did you buy your first hearse and why? Ten years ago, I seen a hearse mm -hmm. on the side of the road for sale. I needed a vehicle. Okay. okay. And it looked cool. It was a 78 hearse. Nobody had one. I was like, cool. And then Lloyd started buying them. And so you turned Lloyd on to the yes. whole idea of, yep. of, of buying of and collecting hearses. And, yep. Would, would Kim ever come along? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Kim Kim loved it, you know, the attention that these get. Those early days, when Kim and Lloyd were active in the Hearst Club, are also their best. But around 2009, things start to change. They weren't really getting along, and I just could tell with the way they were acting that it wasn't how it was at the beginning. What was the problem? Infidelity was the big issue. His or hers? His. Did you talk to your dad about it? I did. I talked to him about that, and he said he loved Kim, and I explained to him that if you love your wife, knock it off. Work on your marriage. And I've also talked to Kim, and I said, you know, if he doesn't change, you need to leave. You know, don't put up with it. Leave. Their failing marriage also worries Kim's younger sister, Brenda. They had their rocky road, you know, and then it seemed to get more and more. What was the number one issue in Lloyd and Kim's relationship? I would say Lloyd always finding um, what he thought was love somewhere else. When we say love, we really mean sex. Correct. She had caught him quite a few times. He had the hearse in the back, and she found out that he was in there with somebody else having sex in the hearst and she caught him oh. as lloyd's reputation for cheating spreads his own mother and brother see firsthand there are serious problems Tell me what you come to know about the dynamics of the marriage between your son and Kim. There was cheating going on in that relationship. Yes, sir. Oh, he had big time. Well, he had, I don't know how many. He had a lot. And there were arguments. Oh, violent. And he wanted her to go to work. It was the idea that she didn't want to help contribute to what they all the wants. It sounds like there were a couple of issues in that marriage. Financial issues. Yep. And fidelity issues. Mm -hmm. Were they fighting physically or was it just arguing and oh, heated words? Oh, no, and... it was... They could get physical. physical. Like I told him, I said, why don't you guys just separate? Leave. He said, well, I love her. She has no place to go. He goes, I don't want to see her out on the street. You know, we'll get through. And I said, Lloyd, I brought you up better than that. If you have all these girlfriends, then you should get rid of her. In May of 2014, just after Mother's Day, Kim's daughter Jennifer receives a strange call from Lloyd. He called me and said, your mom and I got into a fight. The cops came, and she hit an officer or something. So they took her to the hospital for a psych evaluation. And then he says, well, when can you come get your mom's stuff? I was like, why? He's like, we're done. Come get her stuff. I'm like, I am not coming to get my mother's stuff until she tells me to come get her stuff. What do you do? I call police station, ambulances, hospitals, everywhere I can think of, and try to hunt her down. Jennifer can find no sign of her mother. Worried, she calls on her aunt Brenda, who lives near the Dijons. 
she agrees to check on Kim. Jennifer had asked me to check on her mother. So I rode by the house. And I was checking out whose cars were there, if there was any activity. And I kind of did my own investigation on some of this. I actually asked uh, one of my friends who worked for the Postal Service to ask the carrier, when was the last time she'd seen my sister? They used to see my sister on the porch every day with her black dog. And they told me it was about two weeks. It's as if Kim DeJohn simply vanished into thin air. Then one day, out of the blue, Brenda receives a message from Kim's cell phone. I messaged her phone, and the response back was, I'm okay, I just want to be left alone. My sister had a way of writing, which it wasn't capitalizing anything. This text message came back perfect. And I said, no way. That's not her. Where is Kim DeJohn? Did she finally leave her tumultuous marriage? Or is this a case of foul play? Purses are generally used for transporting the dead. But there was a little known community of the living that collects and drives hearses for fun. Kim DeJohn and her husband, Lloyd, belong to a local chapter of one of these car clubs in Michigan called Just Hearsing Around. You're a member of a hearse club. Yes. So tell me what you do. Are there shows? Are there events? Well, I actually organized the Guinness World Record for the largest hearse parade a few years back. Yeah. I started off as a fan of Halloween, and this is an ultimate Halloween decoration for me. We have real day jobs. I just happen to have a weird car. I admit that. Right. Pam, uh, for you and, and Chris. One day I said, I'm going to have one of those. Did you really? Did you yes, say I'm going to get yep. one of those? My family at first. Cried. <laughs> <laughs> yes. In May 2014, when Kim DeJohn suddenly goes missing, her fellow hearse collectors are shaken by the news. They were both actually members of the Hearst Club. That's right, that's right. And so when Kim was missing, we all heard about it, and then we started following the story, like, hope, gee, I hope we find Kim. With the end of May approaching, there's been no sign of Kim for nearly two weeks. Her sister, Brenda, decides it's time to bring in reinforcements. I just didn't feel right about this whole situation. I went to the police station myself. I wanted to know if there was any cause there to that house. I asked if the fire department had went there. The answer was no. I asked if the ambulance had came there. The answer was no. And then I said, I need to file a police report. The next morning, Detective James Wolfe receives a missing person report on his desk. What do you do next? I gotta go down to the scene to see what's going on, see if that I can substantiate or validate anything that's going on. And the scene is, is Kim and Lloyd's house. Their home, yes. Detective, tell me how you approached the scene that morning. When we walked down there, there was a couple hearse there, which is a little unusual. There was some black plastic on the windows up on the upper level of the home. So uh, I wasn't picking up the greatest vibe from it. You knock on the door. Knock on the door, just wait a few moments, and then um, two people answer the door, two women. Tell me about the conversation you have with them. I told them uh, what we knew, and they proceeded to tell me that Lloyd packed up and left all of a sudden. So Lloyd wasn't here. So you didn't enter the home. Did you walk around the grounds of the home at that point? No, we did not. It's kind of a gray area, because this wasn't their home. This was gotcha. Lloyd DeJohn's home and, and Kimberly DeJohn. Right. Neither one lived here, which is another red flag. With Kim nowhere to be found and Lloyd gone too, Detective Wolf is now on high alert. It just doesn't seem right. Why is there two other women in someone else's house? Where's Lloyd at? Where's Kimberly at? 
I don't know too many husbands or wives that just pack up and leave and leave it all behind. Detective Wolf gets the sense that this is no ordinary missing persons case. What happens next? Multiple phone calls are made. We're checking hospitals, morgues. We're calling anyone and everyone we can to investigate this any further. And at this point now, we had secured the house and we're preparing a search warrant. You were going back? We're going back. Tell me about the search. One of the first things that jump out, there's a multi-picture frame as soon as you walk inside the residence that's supposed to have all of these pictures. But the problem is that it's missing several pictures. But there's a picture of one female pretty much in the middle of this entire collage of pictures. It's not Kim. There's no pictures of Kim anywhere. There are no pictures of Kim? Nowhere. No pictures of Kim, no pictures of Kim and Lloyd? There's pictures of Lloyd, but Kim is nowhere to be seen. The empty picture frames seem suspicious, but the bizarre discoveries don't stop there. What else comes out of that first search of the home? There was multiple air freshener cans throughout the home. What did that say to you? It's unknown. Maybe they like air fresheners. Who knows what people like? Pictures are missing. Red flags everywhere. But you have to methodically go about your investigation. Right, you have to follow the evidence. The Dijon house may seem out of the ordinary, but you can't arrest someone for just being weird. Police want to talk to Lloyd directly. Detective Scott Isaacson jumps on the case to help his partner track Lloyd down. You're looking for Lloyd. You want to find him? You want to talk to him? Yes. How'd you find him? The phone pings uh, placed him just outside of our city at a hotel. While police are looking for Lloyd, he makes several phone calls, including one to his sister, Marcella. How did you get word that Kim was missing? My brother called me. What did he say to you? He said, sis, I just want to let you know that Kim's missing, and the cops are looking for me. I'm scared, so I'm just going to drive around for a while. But Lloyd's call to his sister is a slip-up. Police are able to track down his exact location using cell phone towers. They arrest Lloyd on an outstanding traffic warrant and bring him in for questioning. What's your wife's name? Kimberly Dijon. Kimberly Dijon, okay. Where is she at right now? When, when's the last time you talked to her or saw her? Saturday, sometime Tuesday. What Tuesday was that? Is he offering you anything at this point? Is he? Nothing really new. At some points during the interview, I do confront him, uh, directly asking him where Kimberly is, and he would either reply, I don't know, or I'm not going to tell you. So where, where's Kimberly? She's been reported to us as missing. Where is she? I don't know. I mean, aren't you concerned about her at all? Did you ever try to find her or, or anything? I think she's come back on the TV. What do you see? I didn't see he was scared for her. Just, I don't know where she went. Maybe she's at a friend's house. Maybe she has a new boyfriend. He wasn't looking for her. He wasn't looking for answers. Back at the Dijon house, the detectives continue the search. As evening falls, they make a chilling discovery. It was turning dusk. There was a shadow on the carpet on the living room floor, a dark circle. A stain. So they cut that circle of carpet out. What happens next? We did some tests on it, test to see if it could be possibly blood. Forensic experts confirmed the worst. So it was, in fact, blood? Yeah, it was blood. Red flag. It was huge. Lloyd's gone. There's a stain on the carpet. The wife's gone. There was a fight? Yes. For detectives Wolf and Isaacson, there's now enough evidence to hold Lloyd on charges of aggravated domestic violence. 
Police have only been on the case for less than 24 hours, and already things are looking grim. Now they're out to answer two key questions in their search for Kim DeJong. Does the blood on the carpet belong to Lloyd's missing wife? And who are the women police encountered at the DeJong house? In Warren, Michigan, Kim DeJohn has been missing for two weeks when police arrest her husband, Lloyd, and hold him on domestic violence charges in late May 2014. When officers search their home, they find no sign of the 51-year-old grandmother and are instead greeted at the door by two women. Even more concerning, a search inside uncovers a large blood stain on the living room carpet. Kim's daughter's anxieties start to mount. Months earlier, Jennifer had pleaded with her mother to leave Lloyd because of their rocky relationship. You got a truck, I got a van. We could be gone before he gets home, you know. And she's like, no, I'll think about it. I knew that it was tough on her, and so it was hard on me to hear those conversations, to have her call me and say, ah, oh, he's cheating again. Did your mom know the women that Lloyd was cheating on her with? The latest was his own cousin. His cousin? Yes. She just said, I think he's sleeping with his cousin, Angelica. I was just like, who? Are you kidding me? At just 24 years old, Lloyd's half-cousin, Angelica, is half his age. It's a complicated family tree. Orsi Ann, who is Lloyd's mother, is half-sister to Patty, who is Angelica's mother. For the last few months, Angelica has been living with her aunt, Orsi Ann. What starts happening between Angelica and Lloyd? What do you see? Lloyd come over and they would start flirting and they started coming over after work at night playing cards. And I tried to talk to Lloyd. I said, Lloyd, you um, have been coming over quite a bit more than you used to. And I said, I know that you're flirting with Angelica. And you are a married man. She is your cousin. Do you really want to destroy your marriage over her? Though Lloyd denies a romance in the making, Orsian becomes even more skeptical when Angelica asks her to help babysit her son one night. She told me she was going to go grocery shopping at 8 o'clock. And I said, who goes grocery shopping at a specific time? She goes, I just like to go later in the evening. And I thought, mm-mm, you didn't lie to me. 8 o'clock, Lloyd's break. I know what you're up to. So I went up right by Lloyd's shop. And I seen her car come up. And I said, yep, there she is. They were so involved in their conversation and whatever, they didn't even know I was there. What do you do then? I came home, and my husband called Kim. She, in turn, called me. She said, is Lloyd and Angelica together? And I said, yes. She says, is Lloyd there? I said, no, he is not here. Are you lying to me? I said, no, I'm not. She says, okay, well, I'm gonna find him. And she slammed the phone down. The next day, Kim disappears. As police continue their search for Kim DeJohn, or Ann and other family members confirm that Lloyd is having an affair with his half-cousin. They also make the connection that Angelica and her mother, Patty, are the two women who answered the door at the DeJohn house the day before. Detective Wolf and his partner, Detective Isaacson, bring them both down to the station for questioning. What do you learn? 
Basically, they had just moved in, and Angelica was now his girlfriend. And what did now mean? Now, in the, in the sense that Kim was no longer in the house? Right. Something was wrong. When detectives ask Angelica about Kim, she repeats what she says Lloyd told her. Lloyd told Angelica that he and Kimberly started arguing because Angelica had visited him at work. It became very heated. Kimberly was breaking some of Lloyd's stuff. At some point, he said the police were called. Kimberly had been transported by the police after fighting with the police to a psychiatric hospital for evaluation. And when we say the police, that would have been this department? It would have been the Warren Police Department, correct. Was there any record of? Absolutely of none. There was absolutely no calls for service to that address on that night. Police shoot down Lloyd's initial version of events. So Angelica offers them another. He told me that, you know, he had something to that Kim was never actually put in the psychiatric hospital, that he was too embarrassed to say that she, willing, after the whole fight and everything, she willingly left. She no longer wanted to be with him. So he told her a different story? Yes. Detective Isaacson feels certain Angelica knows more than she is letting on and continues to question her. She finally offers them a solid lead. She also informed us that uh, Lloyd had taken a load of dirt in his pickup truck up to his grandmother's house in Lower Michigan. Did he bring anything up there with him? Just brought um, clothes. Uh, lunch pail. Uh, he had a load of uh, dirt in the back of the truck. From uh, he dug a he dug a trench over by the side of the house. What are you thinking as you're as you're hearing this? I didn't get a good feeling for the welfare of, of of Kim at the time. With this new information from Angelica, police expand their search for Kim. Local news stations lead with the story. Still no sign of Kim DeJohn, missing now since May 14th. The search for DeJohn started at her home in Warren and has now expanded to Kimball Township in St. Clair County and to Millersburg in northern lower Michigan. The clock is ticking. Detectives are sent up north to Lloyd DeJohn's grandmother's home where he just came from. For the next several days, police across Michigan join forces in the hunt for Kim. Is there a moment when you are concerned that the case could go cold? Yes. Nothing's panning out. You need a break. We did get a break. As the sweeping statewide investigation continues, detectives step up the search for Kim DeJohn. And this time, they call him the expert. The 51-year-old grandma has been missing since May 14th. Where is she? Is she dead or alive? It's June 2014, and police and family members in Michigan have been searching for Kim DeJohn for days with no concrete leads to her whereabouts or her well-being. An initial search of her house turned up alarming clues, including a large blood stain on the living room carpet. As the investigation unfolds, police begin to suspect the worst. They return to the house with backup. We enlisted the help of Michigan State Police Cadaver Dock. We let him roam around the house. The canine ultimately alerted on a closet in Lloyd and Kimberly's bedroom. And it was kind of significant how the dog alerted. When he gives a positive indication, he's supposed to sit down and not do anything. When he alerted on the closet, he started digging at the closet door and at the floor, very aggressively hitting on it. Detectives had looked in the closet before and found nothing suspicious. But the dog's behavior forces them to dig deeper. What's inside the closet? Junk. Until we get to the bottom. And that's what cracked the case. What was in the bottom of the closet? A lot of blood. Not old blood, not just a little bit of blood, coagulated blood. 
It was still tacky. What does that say to you? Somebody was in there for a while. Still bleeding? Still bleeding, yes. She bled out in the closet. I knew she was dead from what we had discovered. Instead of searching for a missing person, police are now investigating a homicide. They strongly suspect that Lloyd killed his wife, Kim. But how and where he may have disposed of the body is a mystery. Then, some of Lloyd's co-workers come forward with a tip that leads the detectives to an abandoned lot in Detroit. Why were you here? Because this is not too far from where uh, Lloyd and John used to work. One of the co-workers said he had seen him walking away from his business. And there were reports that uh, Lloyd used to dump illegally down here. It's like a bomb went off in this area. It's a wasteland. It's a desolate wasteland. We covered it all on foot, all in that direction there to the fence line. So here we checked this building right here. We are looking for camp. Detective Eisen and I were doing anything it took to locate her. But an exhaustive search of the area turns up no sign of Kim. So Detectives Wolf and Isaacson return to the two people who seem to know the most about Lloyd's missing wife, his half-cousin Angelica and her mother Patty. Patty's responses are baffling and contradictory. We're under the gun. We have to get these interviews done. They could be star witnesses for us. They're either suspects or they're witnesses. The stories kept changing. The stories kept changing. Constantly. What did the house look like when you got back? It was clean. It was clean? Yes. I mean, I heard it was tore up, and he re-cleaned it up. But I don't know that for fact. I don't know that for fact. I don't know that for fact. Patricia used words like hearsay or per se. Nobody uses those phrases over and over and over again. She's trying to prevent the truth from coming out. Frustrated, the detectives amp up the pressure on Patty and Angelica to come clean and help them find Kim. Every time we interviewed Angelica and Patty, they would give us a little bit more information to show that they had a little more knowledge of what happened with Kimberly. So we offered both of them to take a polygraph. And the results of both polygraphs found that they were both being deceptive. The police know these women are lying, but with no new leads, they're paralyzed. But then, in the biggest twist in this bizarre case, Lloyd himself tells the truth. So he ultimately, indirectly, gave you the information. He did. In a jail cell confession to another inmate, Lloyd reveals exactly where Kim can be found. I asked the local police department, can you go drive around and try to follow these directions and see if you can find anything? About an hour later, I got a call from the chief of police up in northern lower Michigan, said he had a possible site for us. We enlisted the help of the same canine unit that searched the residence. What did you find? This is a vacant property. Uh, There's a mound of dirt. You can tell that this area was rather new. There was a tarp over it, some tree branches thrown over it. This ain't right. That was my initial reaction. This doesn't belong here. The way the debris was on this one particular area, there was black dirt. The same black dirt I had seen at Lloyd de John's home was there with up north dirt which is light brown, sandy color. Dog immediately went to the mound of dirt and started digging. I asked the canine handler, what does that mean? She says, that's a positive alert. A positive alert from a cadaver dog? It means a body could be close. In the Michigan State Police crime lab up there, they did a forensic dig is what they call it. 
and basically it's like when people unearth dinosaurs, they dig a little bit of dirt at a time, preserve as much evidence as possible. We started to unearth a tarp, find some plastic. As soon as the plastic has moved, I caught a whiff of an odor that I've, I've smelled before. The body was the same size and stature as, as Kimberly, had the same some of the same tattoos we knew she had. Just over a month after she went missing, police find what they believe are Kim DeJohn's badly mutilated remains. Their discovery is big news across the state. New evidence emerging in the disappearance of a woman from Warren. Police believe they found the body of Kim DeJohn in northern Michigan yesterday, but the trail of blood starts at home. It was wretched enough waiting to find her, but I kept deep down thinking, okay, we're going to find her alive, you know, maybe hurt. But when they found her, I couldn't think anything else because I knew that moment. I started thinking, this is it. That's my mom. She's gone. That was hard. And it was clear to you immediately that Lloyd was responsible? That was my only suspect. Between the stories, the information I had received. Lloyd's daughter Amy learns that her father is a killer after reading the news online. You remember the headline? What did it say? Body possibly a warm and missing woman. You see that headline? And it seems to me that perhaps your worst fears are now confirmed. Yeah. What do you know with almost absolute certainty? That I will not see my dad again. Yeah. On July 2nd, 2014, police charge 46 year old Lloyd the John with first degree murder, disinterment, and mutilation of a corpse. He is held on a million dollar bond. What's your reaction to the news that Kim's body has been found? Thank God there'd be some closure for the family. But how bad is it? How's it gonna hurt my son? Still trying to believe my brother. It's my brother, I'll always love him. But now there's a body. With a body, there's no doubt what it happened to Kim. As Lloyd heads to trial on murder charges, the prosecution preps its star witness, his mistress and half cousin Angelica. More than two years after the body of Kim DeJohn was found in a shallow grave in northern Michigan, her husband, Lloyd, heads to trial on first-degree murder charges. Kim's killing captivates Warren, the working-class suburb of Detroit where the DeJohns live. Every detail of their life is dissected by the media, including their membership in the local Hearst Collectors Club. So your reaction, obviously, total shock and, and just just disappointment it's just it's such a sad story yeah tragic how do you think the media played this all the quotes i kept reading and, and hearing were oh he's a, a weird guy yeah and he even had hearses and, and caskets and that really had nothing to do with it had nothing to do with it had nothing to do with the crime really looking back there were signs of lloyd's dark side Pam remembers one particular exchange with Lloyd at a Just Herson Around event. I happened to be parked a couple vehicles away from him. He had this little skeleton arm thing that had a huge blade in it that he was showing. He was a very unique individual, for sure. When Lloyd's murder trial opened in September of 2016, reporter Jameson Cook covered it for the Macomb Daily News. The prosecutor posed that Lloyd DeJohn planned the murder 
for many years. He, and when the affair was happening with his, his younger cousin, the opportunity was there and he took advantage of it. But Lloyd maintains that Kim's death was an accident, that she struck her head during a fight and died. What do you remember about the opening statement from the defense attorney? He tried to portray his client as a strange guy. He made a mistake and he got scared. But testimony from the medical examiner who performed Kim's autopsy paints a gruesome picture, indicating that her death was anything but an accident. The prosecutor really focused a lot on the violent nature of the death. Lloyd had many opportunities to stop and uh, he kept going. It appeared that she was hit with some type of object in her head. She was bound by duct tape. She had multiple lacerations. She had lacerations on her head along with her abdomen area. She also had, which was quite telling, what appeared to be defensive wounds on her hands and on her feet. Trying to protect herself. Correct. The medical examiner adds a grisly detail. She was alive inside the closet still. She wasn't dead inside that closet yet. Her heart was still pumping. Lloyd's mother, Orsi Ann, is one of the next called to the witness stand. What did she testify to? She testified that he was fascinated with death at an early age. That's an odd testimony. Right. I was surprised to hear that from his own mother. I do remember saying that Lloyd always talked about killing people, you know, oh, I'll, I'll kill that son of a gun, things like this here. It turns out that Orsian's attempt to help her son backfires, and other members of the Dijon family resent her statements in court. You didn't want your mother on the stand? No, because she had, what information did she really have? None, other than the fact that, you know, Angelica and, and Lloyd were having an affair. Everybody knew it. You want me to testify you know, about being involved with the Hearst Club? But she knows nothing about the Hearst Club other than the fact we're in it. No matter what I did, it was wrong. All the way through this whole thing, I've done nothing but wrong. And nobody knows how hurt I've been. I do believe this is, you know, it's, a, it's an accident. He, he, he didn't do it on purpose. One of the last to take the stand is also one of the most anticipated. Lloyd's half-cousin and mistress, Angelica. She receives immunity in exchange for her testimony. How did you feel about Angelica and her mother, Patty, being offered an immunity deal? That was the only thing that I was disappointed with. It really hurts me. But I do kind of understand the prosecution, too, because they kind of needed that testimony. Angelica told things that we didn't even know about until the jury trial when she had to testify. She admitted to she was the one that replied back to Brenda Ertz, posing as Kimberly John, saying, I'm OK, I just want to be left alone. Did she offer new insights into the relationship, the nature of the relationship with Lloyd? Yes, she's the one that gave the ultimatum to Lloyd that night on May 13th. It turns out that Orsian had witnessed Angelica and Lloyd together the night before the murder. Angelica says that she had threatened to end their relationship unless Lloyd got a divorce. Hours later, Kim was dead. The next day, Angelica went to Lloyd's home. What did she tell the court about seeing Lloyd on the 14th, the day of the murder? They were intimate. Where? Downstairs. And the next day, also upstairs in their bed. It's not much of a stretch to imagine that the body was just feet away. Sure. Detective, how twisted is this? Angelica testifies in open court that she had sex with Lloyd on the same day that Kim was killed in Lloyd and Kim's house. He was a womanizer. Like, the rules didn't apply to him. And he almost got away with this. He almost got away with the homicide. 
before she steps down from the stand, Angelica delivers one final blow to the defense. In a video recording by the Macomb Daily News, Angelica details how Lloyd said he killed Kim. Kim was pushed, her uh, head hit the dresser, and she was bleeding profusely that, that Lloyd did, um, you know, take towels trying to clean up the wound and trying to, and trying to help save her, but that he couldn't, and that she was dead. What was the shocker? When she actually um, had said that Lloyd said that Kim was dead. You're still going to stay with that person knowing that, hmm, maybe I'm next? Never crossed her mind? After deliberating for just three and a half hours, the jury finds Lloyd to John guilty of first degree murder. He's sentenced to life in prison without parole. How did you get here? How did this family get here? Where everything is this big mashup? I wish I knew the answer to that myself. Lloyd's sister understands the weight their mother carries for what happened. After all, Orsian is the one who spied on Lloyd and Angelica and confirmed the affair to Kim. You know, my mom has to live with that for the rest of her life, knowing she started that ball rolling. I wish I would have known a little bit more going on that night. There's a lot of what ifs. Yes, he killed her. We all know that. But he didn't come home with that intention. It wasn't premeditated. But the John family is appealing the verdict, hoping to have Lloyd's sentence reduced. What would be the best possible appeal outcome? for you. If he just got life with parole, would be that's 25 years. You want the possibility of parole? Yes. The possibility of parole would mean more to Lloyd than just a second chance at life on the outside. The one part that you're missing is he's never going to see his new baby daughter outside of the bars of a prison. His new baby daughter? Yes. Angelica's baby. Angelica says you have a sister. Yeah, and I don't think of her. I've never met her. Will you? I'm hoping so. I'm hoping that we find out if it's actually my sister. For Kim's daughter, Jennifer, what's most important is keeping Kim's memory alive for her grandchildren. What does this spot represent for you? It just kind of, it kind of reminds me of a childhood because we were always at the lake. My mom had a day off, we were gone. And that was just our life. So, kind of adapted it with my own kids. It's, it's really pretty. It's peaceful. There's always going to be a little bit of that sadness. That's not going to go away. You learn to deal with it. On the Lloyd side of the family accept that he did this. But they're having a hard time with him being sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. If the roles were reversed, huh. they would want justice too. They can go see Lloyd. All I have of Kim are ashes.